What are you going to do, maliciously comply and call the cops? We'll get into that in a bit, but first, thieves? I'm a physician, my coworker is a physician, we practice nephrology somewhere in the USA. We do a lot of visits to dialysis centers along an interstate, eight of them, and it involves a lot of driving to see the patients while they're on dialysis. The system we work for pays us mileage, plus a good salary. Originally, we submitted our own mileage reports and they always approved them. We weren't trying to maximize the money, we both just wanted about $1,000 a month to offset wear and tear and gas on the vehicle. We were actually just photocopying the same report each month, signing it and turning it in. The original company we worked for was totally fine with this arrangement. Well, the system got bought by another system, who apparently believes all their doctors are thieves. We were told we were scamming them, and from now on, a middle manager would be reviewing our billings and using Google Maps to calculate out our mileage each month for us. And this person would make sure we were adhering strictly to their policy for reimbursement. Starts from the office each day, no matter where you started from. Doesn't pay you to drive out somewhere if you didn't see a patient, but just went to sign forms for nurses and other stupidity. Now, I don't like being accused of thievery, especially when I was sure we'd been underbilling for the mileage just to keep things easy and simple. These people don't know me, but I had an Excel sheet with all my patients, their clinics, and a schedule to drive out to them and see them all in as little time and mileage as possible. It was really efficient. So I dove into their travel policy and reconfigured my schedule, not to minimize mileage, but within their policy to maximize it. As a bonus, the new schedule actually has me home each day for lunch on days I do dialysis rounds, so it saved me a little bit of money and improved my mood. For example, since they started from the office and ended from the office no matter where you actually start and end, I start my day at the one close to my house but far from the office, and end my day at the one on the other side of town by my girlfriend's house, where I'd usually hang out after work anyway. Midday I'd go home for lunch, get a nap or nooner and then see a couple people in town so I'd get paid to drive back and then head out for the regular visits that day. Altogether, my average mileage, far from being less like they expected, is actually 90% greater. And on top of this, they're paying this middle manager to deep dive into all our billing to examine the locations and compile the report. She said just to do R2, it takes almost 8 hours, an expense they never had before. I mean, I get it, corporation or company wants to try to save money wherever possible. They always want to bring costs down and profits up. But if you rock the boat in an otherwise well-functioning system and ultimately start trying to nickel and dime the people that are carrying your work, you definitely have a chance to upset them and any niceties they'd been affording you up to this point, at least if I were in that position, they'd become probably a lot less frequent. I mean, you're only really going to have that loyalty when you perceive that it's worthwhile, right? Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, the boss wants me to stand in the corner? Okay. Years ago, I was a photographer at a major theme park and worked with the characters on an almost daily basis. Our famous character is a mouse that owns the whole park. Everyone who worked there either referred to him as Boss or Mr. Mouse around guests. For the purposes of this post, I'll refer to him as Boss. One morning, I was assigned to work with the Boss. He was in a mischievous mood and being an overall goofball. I enjoyed this and so did our guests and character attendants. One of his favorite things to do when he was in a mischievous mood was to try to pass me the autograph books he had signed, conveniently ignoring the fact that I had my hands full with a camera. As I went to take them, he dropped them and run away, making a laughing motion. So we're with this family and Boss does his usual, pass the autograph books to the photographer stunt. He holds them out expectantly and I said, I'd love to, Boss, but you know I don't know my ABCs. At this, the Boss drops the books, takes my hand, moves me to a corner and points to the floor, telling me to stay like I was a naughty child. Malicious compliance mode activated. Okay, I guess I'm grounded, I said, pouting. Everyone at this point is howling with laughter, even our head manager Diane who had stepped in to watch. So Boss continues his interaction with the family. Now at the end of the session, we have the family pose with the character. So Boss gets everyone together and poses with the popular, ta-da, except there's no photographer. After a moment, the boss motions to the family to wait and stomps over to my corner. I'm fighting back a grin at this point as he turns me around, 
points to my camera, and then held his hands up as if to say, What gives? Boss, you told me I'm grounded, remember? I said with a sweet, innocent smile. It's at this point Diane pipes in with, That you did, Mr. Mouse. Boss playfully drags me back to my spot and poses again. We get the photo and send the family on their way. Diane stepped out with them and offered to send them through again to get more pictures because I didn't take many, on account of me being grounded. The family accepted, although the dad, who had tears in his eyes at this point, said it was the hardest he'd laughed in a long time. To this day, it still brings a smile to my face. What I love here is not only would this be great and funny for a kid, but like when you're the parent and you know that there's some guy in there getting maliciously complianced with, there is definitely a double layer of laughs to be had there. I wonder if it looked like to the adults whether or not OP had actually just had enough of working with Mr. Mouse. Our next story is the ongoing saga of the big hairy man baby. Good evening, my wonderful fellow Redditors. It's been a while since I've broken out the pen, so excuse the digital chicken scratch. Many things, both malicious and compliant, freak ups and more, have happened since last year. I usually derive inspiration for telling the tale from equal parts expletives and vindication, smacking back at each other like a feverish tennis match until, in the story we'll call, McEnroe loses his cool like the big hairy man baby he is. In fact, I just changed the title from, I don't want two mediums, give me a dang large, to this very moniker. I run a drive through in Phoenix, Arizona, nestled between cacti and palm trees. We'll call my square burgered joint Mendy's. Around 70% of our customers have been here before, or at least used the exact same credit card, and we really get to know our customers. They get to know us as well. One of these customers, Big Hairy Man Baby or BHMB for short, is in one of his argumentative moods again as he orders his large chocolate frosty. 15 minutes before we close up shop and start, continue cleaning the store. We shut down the frosty machine an hour before close most nights because we try to get out of Dodge before 2am. We all need the overtime and would love to stay and get paid $22.50 hourly but we're strongly encouraged to start the cleaning processes as things wind down. So that's what we do. We like ours, so we make it boss happy. We also know we have many late night frosty eaters, so we make them ahead of time and put them in the freezer. Many of them. We make them mediums mostly and a couple large and small. We usually have some to take home at night. So when he orders his large frosty, I gently explain that all we have is medium and I can give him two mediums which adds to about 1.25 large ones, and explained that he'd be getting more frosty and I would just charge him for the large. He adamantly clapped back at me with the fury of a thousand low stakes issues, slathered with swears, riddled with rudeness. What the freak is wrong with you people? I'm here every freaking day, give me a large. I'll save you the rest of his rhetoric and simply enter malicious compliance. We hadn't pre-made larges, but we did happen to just turn off the frosty machine within the last hour, and it's been too busy to start cleaning it. I knew the second he demanded a kegs that it would be liquidy. Well, literally liquid. Low quality garbage I wouldn't feed my dog. Not just because chocolate kills. The large cup filled so quickly that I couldn't even fold my hands together menacingly as I hovered over my concoction of disappointment. Big hairy man baby gets to the window chooses some more choice words to the tune of, that's what I freaking thought, pays the dough and takes his disgust off into the moonlight. I wish I could see this guy's face as he ate or drank his dessert, but all that chest hair was in the way. You know, I'm just surprised that this guy didn't just immediately whip right back around right into the drive through to complain about their liquid frosty, unless they're one of the people, kind of like me to be honest, that prefer to wait until they get back to their place to have it. Maybe they just assumed they were really unlucky and this thing just melted crazy fast. This next story is, decorate instead of doing my work? Sure, sure. Several years ago, I was working for an organization and they were having their annual holiday decorating competition between the different departments. There were a couple of departments that basically took turns winning every year because a few of the staff there went absolutely nutty with decorating. The departments gave a little budget towards this event, but a few staffers from those two departments put in their own money on top of the department funds and just created some insane, over-the-top displays. I saw pics from a few years. Some of them were very cool, but also probably took a few staffers a few days to set up, and probably cost at least $500 or more. 
For decorations, that's not counting the staff hours that went into it. So my department had its own new office that year. In previous years, we'd been in a small area behind another department. Some people didn't even know we were there. But that year, we were in a nice office space and on the ground floor. So my executive director decides we are going to compete. I think she just wanted to show off to her boss. So she tells me, OP, since you'll be in the office working this weekend, you can make a good start on decorating the office for the competition. I replied, I will be in the office this weekend, but that's because I'll be working on these projects. Remember, we need to be in a good place with these projects before the new year. The boss says, well, no reason you can't do both. Spend a few hours decorating and the rest working. I had only planned to be in the office about four to five hours anyway, so a few hours decorating wouldn't leave me much time to devote to the projects. I said I'd like to get these projects to a good place before our holiday. I'm also not much of a decorator. This is actually true. I moved 14 times in about 17 years. I think it killed any desire I may have had to decorate, and I'm a tomboy. Not very feminine in how I dress or present myself, which I think always bothered boss lady, and not very good with decorating. They said, are you refusing to help your co-workers with this? Note, refusing to help co-workers was a phrase she pulled out most any time someone pushed back on her ideas. She came from the business world to a different industry and wanted to incorporate business ideas that didn't always work. I said, nope, I'll try to spend some time decorating then. That weekend, I stopped at a dollar store and bought several rolls of wrapping paper, put it on the department credit card. When I went into the office, I spent about two or three hours wrapping everything I could think of that was a stable object. Wrapped most of our desks, our filing cabinets, some bookshelves, some end tables we had in the front office area, basically making them unusable. Someone would have to break through the wrapping paper and ruin the decoration to get into their desk or the filing cabinets, or the bookshelves. Everyone spent the next week not being able to functionally do some of their work because they couldn't get into their desk or filing cabinet. Our office had a very easy week right before the holiday. We didn't even place in the competition, and I heard boss lady got scolded the next month by her boss because we were behind on the projects. To be honest, if I were in OP's position, knowing that this is a new office and it's probably important to look good, I'd be hesitant to do any of this decoration stuff too over trying to prioritize keeping these projects that the office needs to stay on top of going. This next story is, what are you going to do about it? Call the cops? I was explaining to my mom what malicious compliance was and she reminded me of this story. I was a senior in high school when all of a sudden I got sick at school and had to be sent home. Because my car was in the shop, mom had to come get me. It's about 9.30 a.m. when this happened. As we're driving up a very busy street, we see two seven or eight-year-old kids, we'll call them Frank and Zelda, trying to cross. Worried, mom pulls over to see what's going on. The conversation went roughly as follows. She said, kids, are you guys okay? What are you two doing here? Frank said, Dr. Idiot said we couldn't come to school early, so he sent us home. Now, mom is very familiar with Dr. Idiot. He was the principal of the elementary school my younger brother was attending at the time. My brother Mark was going through some behavioral issues at the time and mom was commonly called to the office, to the point that they were on a first name basis. Not that he allowed her to use his first name because, I have a doctorate in education so it's doctor idiot. So in other words, he was an entitled idiot. There was a gas station 10 feet away, so mom tells Frank and Zelda to meet us there. We pulled in, got some water for the kids as it was a hot day, and mom calls Dr. Idiot's cell phone. Again, the conversation went roughly as follows. This is Dr. Idiot. Mom said, hi, this is Mark's mom. I have two kids here named Frank and Zelda, and they say they were sent home early? Idiot says yes, their parents dropped them off at 6am because they had to work. Something about mandatory overtime. Of course, we're not at daycare, so I just told the kids to go home and wait for the bus. Mom said, are you kidding me? We're five miles away from the school. They walked all that way. It's a wonder they weren't hit by a car or kidnapped. Idiot said, what are you going to do about it? Call the cops? Click. Mom was absolutely floored, but she decided to give Dr. Idiot a nice dose of reality. At the time, we lived in a small town. How small? So small that sometimes the chief of police would have to walk the beat. In that day, he happened to be a block or so away from the gas station. 
When he got the call, he arrived, got the whole story from not only Frank and Zelda but from mom and me, and being a father of two elementary-aged kids himself, he was ticked. He looked at mom and said, It's time I had some words with Dr. Idiot. The chief of police drove Frank and Zelda to the school in the squad car, which they were super excited about, personally escorted them to their class, and then marched to Dr. Idiot's office and proceeded to tear him a new behind, telling Dr. Idiot that he'd help the parents press charges on him for child endangerment, among other things. From that day on, Dr. Idiot allowed Frank and Zelda to be at school early on the days their parents had mandatory overtime. Update, so I got some details from mom about why Frank and Zelda were just dropped off at school. Their aunt works at the elementary school and had agreed to watch them until school started a couple of hours later. She wasn't on the clock. Frank and Zelda didn't live in a good part of town, and their parents, understandably, didn't feel their kids would be safe if they were alone. If Dr. Idiot had driven them home to wait for the bus, it wouldn't have gotten on the chief of police's nerves. I mean, fundamentally, he should not have done that, for sure, 100%. At the same time, it's not fair on the principal and the school to have these kids dropped off when it's just inconvenient for the parents. And if the whole ant update part was true, why weren't they any factor in the story at all? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.